Saluton, bon venon al uh, Moe Gamer Podcast. Mi estas Pete Davison de MoeGamer.net. Yen Chris Kasky de MrGilderPixel.com. Terpomo estas legomo. Uh, hi. Hello. How are you? Hello. Oh, are we in full Esperanto mode this morning? That's about the limit of my abilities at the minute, but, uh, you know, it's 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 working. It's working. Um, for those I'm impressed. Missing, yes, for those missing the context, um, the current co- cover game on MoeGamer.net is a visual novel called The Expression Amrelato, which is both a charming Yuri romance visual novel and um, a game that teaches you the basics of Esperanto as well. So, um, well worth checking out if you're interested in language learning and girls kissing. So, you know. A fine combination of, uh, of fun times there. But anyway, uh, right, what are we here to do? We're here to talk about video games today. So we've got to follow our usual format today, uh, back to normal after E3 Chaos. Uh, it's been a little while since we reconvened, so there's probably going to be a fair bit of news to cover today. Uh, so we're going to be kicking off with that, then we'll continue with what we've been playing recently, and then today's main topic will be, um, we thought we'd explore the SNK 40th anniversary collection a bit, because it's uh, something we've both picked up uh, a little while back and have been spending some time with, and there's some great games in there that uh, in a lot of cases don't really get talked about nearly enough, so we wanted to give them a bit of love today. So, let's kick off with the news first of all. Where would you like to begin? Where would I like to begin? Let's begin at the beginning. So, uh, since our last episode, we got some exciting news about Disaster Report 4. Yes. Which is coming west. Yes, uh, so that's coming for PS4, Switch, and PC, and that's going to be next year, uh, from the sound of things, um, which is good. Uh, I don't know a ton about this game, but I know that um, it's it's quite well regarded, um, and it's something I've sort of had half an eye on for a while, but I'd kind of be working on the assumption that we wouldn't see it, But so this is was a really pleasant surprise to, mm-hmm. to hear that we were going to get it, so... Yeah, looking forward to that. Do you know much about this series? It's always just kind of skirted under my radar. Like, I've always mm-hmm. been aware of it since, you know, since the PS2 days, but I've never actually played a, to- a copy of it. it interestingly enough, um, you know, for those of us, you know, specifically like you and I, we're super interested in kind of the melding of mechanics and theme. Mm-hmm. And I think what's really interesting about the Disaster Report series is, from what I understand, they're essentially survival horror games. They really yeah. they yeah. mimic pretty much all the mechanical standards we expect from a survival horror game: scarcity of resources, imminent danger, fragile player characters, but of course a grounded, semi-realistic setting that's free of horror and monsters. The the environment yes. itself is the monster, which is a really interesting concept. Yes, and from what I understand as well, there's quite a sort of focus on the uh, the kind of humanity of the characters, isn't there? And sort of sort of what people do when they're in a situation like that, and how they interact with each other, and whether you save one another or whether you look out for yourself and that sort of thing. So yeah, lots of lots of potentially interesting stuff here. Um, I tell you what, I always get this game modelled up with, which is uh, Disaster Day of Crisis on the Wii. Um, which, mm. if you're not familiar, was uh, a game by Monolith Soft before yeah. uh, Xenoblade. Uh, I haven't actually played that yet. It is on my shelf. But um, yeah, I do always get Disaster Report mixed up with that for obvious reasons. Disaster Report's the one with its roots in IRAM, right? That's the one that's been around forever. I think so, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, whereas uh, Disaster Day of Crisis was um, was a one-off. Thing. Right, right. Um, so I'm just looking up now. Yeah, it started back in the PS2 era. Uh, yeah, and it was IRAM originally. Yeah. Um, yeah, early ones did get localized, actually, from the look of things. That's yes, kind of yeah, I think just three didn't get localized. Yeah. I remember okay. one and two coming out on the PS2 era. But yeah, I never I never got around to playing them. It was always just something that was not a top priority for me. But um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really interested. I mean, uh, one of the things I think that's really neat about this series is that they don't just shoot from the hip. Like, they actually do extensive research. They talk to real firefighters. They talk to real first responders about situations and the safest way to handle these dangerous situations so like yeah there's there's actual stories of like you know a couple of years ago when there was all those issues with the earthquakes and and uh tsunami damage in japan of people online talking about the fact that they actually employed skills that they learned playing disaster report to mitigate some of those crises because it's actually full of useful information <laughs> yeah definitely definitely 
Yeah, um, yeah. I'm just I'm just looking up the first one now, um, and like a, a key part of the game in the first one, and I imagine something similar is is there in the other ones as well. Is that as well as just surviving it, you have to sort of uh, uncover what the reasons for it were as well. Yeah, um, yeah. And so as as part of that, there would be things like sort of looking into safety and and how things are constructed and what might have caused. That bad things to happen and that sort of thing so yeah potentially a really interesting thing there i've been noticing a little bit of a trend of um sort of japanese popular media being a bit more educational recently so i mean i mean besides uh Amarillo, which i've already mentioned uh we've got things like the currently running anime um how heavy are the dumbbells that you lift which i watched oh, the first yeah. episode of earlier today uh which as well as being absolutely charming fan service nonsense um has also got some genuinely helpful information in it as well about workout and nutrition and stuff hmm. um and then yeah I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of other examples as well that that, that sort of use popular media as a way of engaging people with um learning things which is a really good way of doing it and much certainly much better than the old edutainment approach yeah yeah because there was that <laughs> there was that other anime like two or three seasons back about like um like microbiology of the human body that's right yeah like cells pers- work. yeah personifying yeah. the different cells yeah and that yeah, was really so- well spoken of Yes, yes, there was that, and there was um, Yuru Camp as well, or Laid Back Camp, as it's known in some places. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. uh, that was that was all about sort of um, uh, it was. I mean, outdoorsmanship. Uh, uh, Hart, yeah, uh, Hart, it was just a sort of fairly charming story about girls going camping. But again, in the midst of all that, there was helpful advice about sensibly uh surviving out in the wild and um camping effectively and safely and respecting nature and that sort of thing so yeah this yeah been a bit of a trend for that lately which is uh, i'm all for to be honest yeah it's cool i like to learn things mm, cool all right let's continue uh what have we got next so the first new trails game first new trail series game screenshots reveal some familiar characters according to silicon era um so there was a recent live stream about the 15th anniversary of the uh trail series by falcom mm-hmm. um so um and they've been showing off some new characters for the new game so it looks like the newer games are going to be exploring uh, the western side of the game world which is the content of zemuria um half of which hasn't been explored in the games at all yet so there's going to be a lot of new stuff to explore uh there's going to be some stuff to do with the islands down towards the south of the main landmass from the look of things and um yeah as far as the familiar characters go the only trails game i've played today is the first trails in the sky so i i can't speak with great authority on the on the characters yet but uh yeah it looks like there are going to be some returning characters from um the the other series that currently exist so the ones we've had over in the west are trails in the sky and trails of cold ski cold steel uh and then there's uh tr- i think it's trails of zero is the one that we haven't had yet yeah those are the ones with the, the roots in the psp as well and we never yes saw those. that's right but there is talk that that we might see them in some way yes, uh, I, yes. I read an interview with kondo the, the head of Falcom yesterday that was posted on an RPG site where he was like, listen, we want to do it. We want to bring these to the people. Like, if a publisher comes to us with an interesting proposition, like, we want to do this. Because yeah. they're sad that these the, the Zero um, series has essentially been kind of rendered inaccessible to a lot of people because it's trapped yeah, on yeah. the PSP and Vita. Yeah. Um, and so, it's Japanese only as well. And it, yeah, and it's Japanese only. So, yeah, I mean, the, the main reason I posted this article was just, just that it's cool. You know, I don't know anything about these returning characters as well. It's not a series I'm super familiar with, but I've just always found the overall construction of the the Legend of Heroes series interesting, and and how specifically with the Trails series they focus on individual um, regions of this world and continue yeah. and yeah. continue to build a branching narrative across what is now essentially. Let's see, Trails in the Sky is three games, Zero is two games, so we're at five games, and the Cold Steel is capping off at four games. So four, nine yeah. yeah, so nine games all taking place in the same world in the same continuity, and so few game developers willing to put this kind of 
gamble on building yeah. a, a cohesive world because the yeah. the fear is always that like well the newcomers won't know where to dive in and they'll be confused but falcom is basically like we're focusing on making interesting characters and having yeah. nods to the previous games in there and if you understand them great but for those of you who do understand and have played the previous games we're building something wonderful and and i think that's so cool because you know you think back to like final fantasy or whatever and it's just the the usually the sensibility is to have callbacks and shared themes but not necessarily a shared mm. world so yeah the, uh, the the essentially the legend of heroes games uh, hew really closely in my mind to like an epic fantasy uh, book series that's been yes. going on like forever yes. right like i'm reading robert jordan's wheel of time series right now i love to read as well and it's that, that that's like 14 books long yeah. It's just an yeah. ever-growing world, and yeah. so few games are willing to put in that type of investment. And within that series, presumably, there's there's smaller arcs of, of specific characters, and it sort of shifts focus as it goes through, presumably, as well. Yeah, of course, because yeah. people age, people die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because because that that's ex exactly what Trails does. Like like I say, I, I I've only played Trails in the Sky, but I know how well regarded the whole thing is. And certainly from my experience with the first Trails in the Sky, yeah, the world building is absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I mean, even though the the early Trails in the Sky games were based on the old um, sort of PSP era Ease engine, so sort of isometric polygon environments with sprite characters on top of them, they packed so much detail into those worlds, and then they built on top of that with things like dialogue and side quests and that sort of thing so um it, you could sort of push your way through the main story of trails in the sky but the the sort of exploring the world through these side quests and stuff and getting to know these incidental characters that weren't necessarily relevant to the main plot but just helped you get a better feel for each area that you visited was uh, a real attraction of that for me and it's uh something that i think continues with the with the rest of the series so yeah falcom's always been really good at this i mean it's uh, what they're doing with trails is basically very similar to what they do with ease isn't it because ease is also a yeah, series that over, world. That, that over the long term is exploring a whole world a bit at a time so yeah uh, it's just that, that uh, ease does it over the course of slightly shorter games whereas the trails games are all very long so um yeah, yeah. well I have been. I have dedicated myself to buying the Cold Steel series on PS <laughs> on, P, on PS4. I don't know if I'm ever going to get to. The, I, I've kind of resigned myself to the Cold Steel games being like some an investment for when I retire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like when I'm in like my mid 60s, I'll finally like hunker down. Yeah. All I know is either th is it either three that's coming out soon or four that came out in Japan recently. But like one of the most recent Cold Steel games has Sherazad from Trails in the Sky in it. Ah, oh, fantastic. And yes. she's the best, so I'm quite Drunken excited. Drunken waifu, gotta love yeah. her. Yeah, so, I, yeah, I want to play these games. I just know if I start playing them, uh, MarioGamer.net for the next year will be a Trails, a Trails fan site. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that is all yeah. I will have time to play. Um, yeah. These games are it, massive. It, yeah, it'll, it'll, ha it'll happen at some point. Uh, it needs to happen because these are games that are worth exploring, so... All right, uh, let's move on. So, what do we got next? Uh, Bandai Namco announces a new online action RPG called Blue Revival. Uh, I clicked on the wrong thing, so I've got to think about Mighty Switch Force. One sec. Oh, uh, <laughs> Blue, Blue Protocol. Blue Protocol, beg your pardon. I don't yeah, know anything about this, and I kind of don't care because it's an online multiplayer RPG for PC, but it looks beautiful. It's got these Oh my cool god, have you seen the character creator? It, yeah. It's, oh, it's amazing. Um... Yeah, so this this is built on Unreal Engine four, um, and the the graphics have they've absolutely nailed the sort of cell shaded style. It looks like an anime. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, so yeah, I, I, again, I don't know a ton about the game itself, um, but I think there is a closed beta running at the minute. Uh, I'm not sure how much people are allowed to talk about that at the moment, but I've mm. seen some screenshots and videos coming out of the character creator at the very least as well. And there's been some deliberate um, attempts by the developers to allow you to create sexy characters from the sound of things as well. And I saw a thing from, um, I think it was Giuseppe from Twinfinite, posted a video of him sort of playing with the various sliders and so on. And you can you can sort of make make your ideal woman in it, and it's oh, lovely. Um and presumably your ideal man as well, should you... Uh, yeah, it's just a very that. robust character creator. Yes. And, yes. like, I love, like... Sometimes I will buy an MMO 
not renew my subscription just for the fun of fiddling around with its character creator for a month. Oh, yeah, like, I, I love a good character builder. Absolutely, yeah. And, um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm glad um, Japan has kind of latched onto this with stuff like Custom Made and, and Honey Select as well, sort of making games that are specifically basically just a character creator with maybe a, a token game attached to them as well because there's obviously a lot of appeal there as well. Um, sure. Talking of which, custom made order, uh, custom order made three D two is supposed to be out very soon officially in the West. Um, they said it was going to be on the twelfth, but I think it's got pushed back to the nineteenth. So, watch out for that. There is a page for it on Steam right now. Um, the Steam version has none of the sexy stuff, so it basically has none of the game in it. Um, but it does have the character creator, and you can download a patch for it for I think five dollars or something like that to, to mm. put all the porn back in it. Um, but to be honest my, my main attraction with custom made is the photo mode anyway so like all it, as most people probably know by now all my mascots and sort of monthly patreon wallpapers and stuff are created using custom made 3d2 so it'll be nice to actually uh, give something back to that rather than using a pirate fan translated copy and also to be able to understand the interface without clicking on five buttons to find the one thing i'm looking for because i don't read kanji <laughs> <laughs> um but anyway um you're, yeah you're I too busy learning languages that aren't real now <laughs> <laughs> well i'm sorry not that, it's not that it's not real it's just that it's not useful <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a constructed language it's not that it's not real it's a constructed language yes uh there we go anyway um so i mentioned mighty switch force before so on july the 25th uh the mighty switch force collection is coming to playstation 4 is it just PlayStation 4? No, it's also coming to Switch, Xbox One, and PC, according to WayForward. So, this is nice. So, it includes um, the original Mighty Switch Force, its updated re-release, the sequel, and a former PC exclusive, all in one package. Uh, presumably going to be digital only, I think, but this is the kind of thing that Limited Run will probably be picked yeah. up at some point. So. They have a good relationship with WayForward, specifically. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they've done the shantae games so yeah also like even if limited run doesn't pick it up like this has asia region english language version written all over it. it's like mm -hmm. either way finally these games will be archivable i'm sure of it and they're wonderful games btw yes yes i i haven't played them myself but i have played the shantae half genie hero dlc which is uh, basically turns the game into mighty switch force and i had a lot of fun with that so yeah interested to try the the originals Okay, moving on. Uh, Atelier Razor and her thighs uh, have been confirmed <laughs> to be coming west. Uh, and they are, that will be releasing in North America in October and Europe in November. Uh, I think they've, they've put out a, a bit of gameplay footage now as well, and people seem to have been responding to that quite positively. So um, a, a lot of ways there seem to be, uh, this seems to sort of be quite different from a number of Atelier games, from what uh, people who know the series a bit better than I do have said. Um so yeah, people seem to be excited and hyped about this. There is a ton of fan art of Riser out there. She's adorable. Yeah. Also, also worth noting is like they've it has a whole new crafting system. Yes, like they've yes. They've, to they've torn the old crafting system down and built something entirely new for this game, which is really yes. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so for for those who have been interested in Atelier but ha haven't haven't been sure where to jump on with it, this this is going to be a good place to start, I think, because it's going to be a complete kind of rethink of how it does things as well. So you could play this and then gradually explore the other the other series as well. So yeah, yeah definitely. I'm definitely. starting to think this will finally be the one I jump on for, <laughs> um, just because it, it it's it's a good jump. Like you said, it's a good it's a good place to start. It, it's such yeah. a, it's a fresh it's a fresh start. Also, um, I, I'll just not obsess about Ryza herself too much, but oh my god, those backgrounds. Oh, it's beautiful. Like, like the new engine that they're using, like the, the backgrounds and the, the, the vistas and like the wavy grasses. Like, just, ah. just, the, just the use of color as well. Like the whole thing seems to be slightly more heavily saturated than um, other Atelier games, which tend to take a sort of fairly pastely approach. So this, this yes. is sort of really, really in your face color in this one. And it's, yeah, it's really striking. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's quite a different look and feel, and and, mm. and to be honest, like I've, it's one of the things I've always kind of not liked about the other Atelier games. Like that that mm -hmm. soft that soft color palette isn't really to my liking. I'm, a, you know, anyone who's looked at my artwork knows like just yeah. like super oversaturated color is what I'm drawn to. So yeah, Ryza aesthetically speaks to me a lot more than previous games have. Mm -hmm. 
All right, uh, moving on. So, a couple of bits of Dragon Quest news have been happening recently. So, uh, first of all, Square Enix's Dragon Quest XI team is apparently working on a new Dragon Quest for the next generation, and they're currently recruiting for that. Um, but alongside that, there was also a uh, an anniversary live stream for Dragon Quest IX recently, yeah. um, where they talked about the possibility of a remake. Um, now, obviously, there's a few tr challenges in place on that. Uh, so those who haven't played Dragon Quest IX, there was quite a strong emphasis on kind of the post-game in that, uh, which involved things like uh, using the Nintendo... It was DS, not 3DS, wasn't it, Dragon Quest IX? Yeah. 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 So there was um, a lot of emphasis of, of, of using um, sort of the, the wireless communication facilities of the, uh, the Nintendo DS to pick up treasure maps and things from other players and that sort of things. And so there was, there was a lot of stuff that was kind of dependent on both social play and online play and that sort of thing. And they, they've been trying to work out how what would be the best way to implement that in a remake of that or even if they need to incorporate that at all so apparently they did a survey of people who um were interested in a remake of what platform they wanted on and 90 percent of the audience said they wanted it on switch oh, of course which is, which is not at all surprising um and um yeah it seems that they're the, the team behind it are very interested in the recently announced nintendo switch Lite, which we'll talk about in a moment as well um and they're also quite interested in involving level five in uh, this remake as well so um as they yeah, should the, be yeah so nothing nothing um sort of confirmed on this as yet but they are extremely interested in making this happen from the look of things uh, if you look over on uh Gimatsu, there's quite a substantial uh transcript of uh, the discussion that was on the live stream and so, so they, they talk a lot about the things that they have to consider and about what they liked about the game and that kind of thing so um yeah, it looks like this this may well happen at some point. So fingers crossed for that, um, because it'd be nice to have an updated version of that. Mm. Nine is a just a phenomenal game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like truly. I just I remember when it had come out, and even like I remember the Nintendo like direct events and stuff, and like Reggie being like, "I've put over a hundred hours into Dragon Quest." <laughs> Not like it's so good. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. All right, uh, continuing on. Um, so, uh, a game called NG is coming west for PS4, Switch, Vita, and PC in October. Uh, and what this is, this is the second entry in um, a series by Experience, who made Demon Gaze. Um, it's their Spirit Hunter series, which is a series of uh, horror games. Um, so, the most recent release of those we've had in the West is Deathmark. Uh, which came out a little while back. Um, came out ages ago in America, but the the physical uh, European version has only just come out, so I only just got my copy from Axis' new uh, European store. Uh, but yeah, I'll probably be having a look at this around Halloween this year, because it looks cool. So NG is the second entry in this, and it's described as a companion story to Deathmark. Uh, it follows the story of a young man on a life-threatening quest to discover who or what is responsible for the disappearance of his little sister. Um, so along the way, there's going to be sort of ghosts and spirits and shady characters and heavy decisions to make and that sort of thing. Um, this apparently uh, features uh, a mechanic called the judge system, which allows you to respond to each event with a spectrum of reactions and emotions. Uh, there's the, sort of it's not just a uh, sort of passive visual novel either. There's sort of active adventure game style gameplay in it as well. So you have to mm. use your use your flashlight to examine each location to find stuff and discover things and that kind of thing. So yeah, um, so like I say, I'll be I'll be exploring Deathmark later in the year because um, it looks really cool. Um, Experience does lovely artwork, and so yeah, Deathmark is no exception to that. And this has got a really, really lovely, distinctive aesthetic. And it seems they're sort of carrying that on with NG as well. This is sort of uh, steeped in sort of turquoises and greens and dark shades yeah. and that sort of thing. It's a it's a really distinctive look to it. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that. Uh, right, what Experience is... and I have a kind of funny relationship because I, I don't really like their games, but I just keep buy <laughs> I just keep buying them because the art is insane. Oh, they are beautiful. They are beautiful. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. And yeah, I I, I, I like them a lot because they they are pretty much who got me into Dungeon Crawler. So I played Demon sure. Days and I was like, oh, I kind of like this now. Um, whereas I'd sort of I'd sort of usually bounced off Dungeon Crawlers prior to that, but yeah, Demon Gaze led me to Dungeon Travelers Two, which is one of my favorite games of all time, and so. So, yeah, 
pretty good. I still <laughs> get so angry that we never got that sequel to Dungeon Travelers 2. I know, it's localized. a real bummer, and, it's, and it probably won't happen now, unless it gets ported to Switch. I'm still holding out hope that it will get ported to Switch and localized when that happens. But Not uh, beyond the realm of possibility. No, no, I mean, there's, there's stranger things have happened recently, but uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Uh, or, or a new one, you know, a new one would be fine. Um, but anyway. They, they gotta do it... Um mary skelter style a new one and any old ones just on there as a bonus oh that'd be great yeah i would never put my switch down not that i'd put it down that often i was gonna say you you would never put it down more (laughs) (laughs) Uh, all right uh continuing on um is sega and ace team uh announced a uh, bit of a surprise game a little while back called soul seraph uh, which appears to be a successor to act razor um so it combines uh sort of side on platforming hack and slash gameplay with uh top down strategic god game type stuff um and so you're controlling a divine entity called helios uh tasked with rebuilding civilization and defending the population against mythical demons um and so you have to fight off all these demons and help rebuild this and um just to further add to the act raiser uh, comparisons. Yuzo Koshiro is behind the uh, soundtrack of this, um, and the story has been written by. Yeah, okay. I'll just give you a moment, shall I? <laughs> yeah. It's very important to pause for the gravity whenever Yuzo Koshiro is involved, because um, he's the best. Yes. Uh, so that's very good news on that. Uh, and the writer is someone who worked on the Talos Principle, which I ha- I haven't played, but I understand is quite well regarded as well. So yes, it's, been... it's on my list of things to check out too. Yeah. So I think this is out really soon, actually, isn't it? Um, I'm sure I saw Sega sort of hyping it up as sort of being out in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, so this is pretty soon, I think. July Talos. 10th. So it's out now. <laughs> oh, cool. Fair enough. Cur- okay. Cur- so that's out. Yeah, so if you've been hungering for some ActRaiser, then uh, check that out, because it looked kind of cool. ActRaiser right. 1, not ActRaiser 2. Act yes, Razor, yes, ActRaiser yes. 2 can take a, take a <laughs> long walk off a short <laughs> cliff. Yeah, I, I haven't played ActRaiser 2, but I understand that we don't talk about ActRaiser 2. <laughs> we, can talk, we can talk about ActRaiser 2's stunning sprite work. Ah, yes. But yes. We, can't, we can't talk about how ActRaiser 2 plays, because it's a very mm. frustrating game. <laughs> <laughs> and not for fun reasons. Not Dark Souls frustrating, just frustrating, frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, moving on, just a quickie. Uh, Valkyria Chronicles 4 has dropped to $29.99, and a complete edition has been announced, uh, which uh, includes the... DLC and some extra bits and pieces from the sound of things. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it looks like if you've if you've been holding off from Valkyria Chronicles Four, you can now pick up this complete edition, and you get more stuff than you would have done if you just buy the DLC as well, which is nice. Um, those who have bought the original game and all the DLC, you can get the extra stuff for another twenty four ninety nine if you want as well. So you can sort of upgrade to the complete edition if you want. Uh, so Everybody cool. should buy this game. Valkyria <laughs> Chronicles is so great. <laughs> yeah. A, a, a series I haven't engaged with at all yet, but I know people keep saying, oh, you haven't played Valkyria Chronicles. You need to play Valkyria Chronicles. And yeah, yeah. I, know, I know I need to play Valkyria Chronicles. I will, I uh, promise, at some point. Probably. The important thing to remember from a development and history perspective is that Valkyria Chronicles is made by former staff of Overworks. Mm-hmm. So we're never going to get another Skies of Arcadia, but Valkyria Chronicles is essentially the, well, that's from the people who made Skies of Arcadia. Like that's yes. their that's their series. So yes. complete. Continue to support them, and they're fine. Mechanical, mechanically interesting, and artistically impressive works. Please. Yes, definitely, definitely. So. Thumbs up for that. All right, next thing I've got on the list is the Nintendo Switch Lite, uh, which was announced uh, a couple of days ago at the time of recording. Uh, So the Nintendo Switch Lite is coming out on September the 20th. Um, It's going to be a smaller model of the Switch that is about $100 cheaper than the standard model. Uh, It doesn't have detachable Joy-Cons. It doesn't have HD rumble. It doesn't have motion controls. um, You can't connect it to a TV, and it's quite a bit smaller, but it is $100 cheaper, and it comes in um, three colors including gray horrible yellow and horrible blue um, and, the, and there's a cool and there's a cool pokemon limited edition one yes that's right that's, so that's a lovely white 
yeah, alongside Sword and Shield, there's a there's a, a Pokemon coming one coming out that sort of has uh, so the Joy Cons on the sides have sort of got accents on the buttons that um, sort of go with the uh, the sort of key colours of the two variations, and then there's sort of an etched design on the back as well um, that features the the legendaries from Sword and Shield. Um, so yeah. Um, the oh the other thing tonight as well is that the left Joy-Con on this has a D-pad rather than the four buttons because yes. the joy because the Joy-Con isn't detachable it doesn't need to have buttons instead of a D-pad so it's just got a standard D-pad so um what do you think of this um well it's complicated um <laughs> what the way I've been contextualizing this in my discussions with people is remembering that this isn't for me mm -hmm. who is this for yes. yes. Who is this for? This is for the 13 and under crowd. Yes. This is for parents who are looking for the next handheld for their kids. Who That that age group where they're not going to invest three to $400 on a console for, but they would have bought their kid a DS. This is the new DS. Yes. So it, it's important to contextualize the Switch Lite as understanding that this is Nintendo's handheld mm -hmm. now, yep. now. So, cool. It's great that yep. it exists. It's not for me. But it's awesome that it exists, and the more yep. people who have their hands on Switches, the better. The yep. end. Yep, that's exactly how I feel about it. And I've, I've seen some people getting really angry about the fact that you can't connect it to a TV, and I, I just want to say, well, how, how do you think they made it $100 cheaper? <laughs> it's like they took a bunch of stuff out, that's why it's cheaper. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it is not for... It is not for everyone. It's for people who want a more affordable way of just getting on board with Switch games. It is for, as you say, parents who want to give their kids a handheld rather than a console. Um, yeah, I, I, I see no real downside to this because it's not as if it's making the old Switch go away or anything. It's, yeah, it's it's just complementing it. So, yeah, I'm all for it. Um, I think that's probably all I have to say on that, to be honest. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's, it's cool that it exists. It's Nintendo hardware. It's beautifully designed. It's awesome. It's just not for me. Yeah. Um, you know, my current switch doesn't. <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing about my current switch that says I need another one. <laughs> and the portability for someone who has a current switch isn't a big deal because are you going to take the memory card out of your switch nah. and put it and put it in this thing to go on the go? No, not really. And it's not that much smaller. So really, it's it's specifically for people who don't have a switch yet who only care about the handheld aspect or younger people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, so moving on. Uh, next thing I've got on the list uh, is that uh, Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth Complete Edition has been announced for Switch and PC. And this includes both Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth and Digimon Story Hacker's Memory as well in one package. Um, mm -hmm. And also includes any of the uh, DLC that was released for those as well. Apparently, uh, the only other change besides sort of including the DLC in there is that some of the billboards in the game have changed due to contractual reasons. So presumably there was some sort of product placement and stuff in yeah, there that yeah. is, either yeah. isn't anymore or is something different now. So, um, yeah, this is cool. Um, I actually picked up uh, this on PS4 ages ago and I don't think I've even taken it out of shrink wrap yet. So I'm kind of tempted to get the Switch version now because yeah. you know, having an RPG on the go is always good. And if you get two games for the price of one, so much the better. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't played um, Hacker's Memory yet, mm -hmm. but the but Cyber Sleuth get, it has the distinct honor of being a game I've actually beaten in the past five years. Like I liked it, oh, that wow. I liked it that much, like seventy five wow. plus hours. Like I actually, um, so like the reason I was like I gotta post this news story is because you know whenever I can. I gotta plug Wild Arms. Uh, so, so, so uh, yeah. So the, these games are specifically they're developed by Media Vision, which is the yep. Wild, which is the Wild Arms team. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, whenever they make something, I buy it. Um, but it's they're just a great turn-based RPG with a monster collecting and breeding element and cute characters and kind of fun scenarios and just really comp. You know, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you they're the best game ever made, but it's a perfect handheld RPG. Mm -hmm. it's just super addictive to collect all the monsters yeah so yeah and like you said two games for the price of one cyber sleuth alone is like i mentioned a, a very comprehensive game so mm -hmm. to get them both together because i didn't buy hacker's memory yet so i'll definitely be grabbing this yeah yeah cool 
All right, uh, continuing on, we've had uh, confirmation that the often delayed RPG based on the Danmanchi anime, or also known as Is It Wrong to Try and Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon, uh, that is coming out finally on November the 28th. And it was originally announced for PlayStation 4 and Vita, but it's also now coming to Switch and PC as well. So, And the noteworthy thing about this, um, for people listening to this, is that the PS4 and Switch versions are getting Asia English versions. Um, so if uh, if this is a series that you like and you want to play the game of it, um, yeah, Play Asia have probably got you covered in the case of this one. Uh, worth noting as well that the PS4, uh, the PS4 Switch and Vita versions uh, also get a bonus shoot 'em up game with it. Um, if you, <coughs> yeah, sort of sort of the early ones. Um, I have a feeling that this might have been included on one of the Blu-rays of the series at some point, or I, m- I might be getting it mixed up with some with some something I, else because I know I remember some reading these, something like that. Yeah, I know that, that, that several sort of isekai series, like uh, Konosuba is another one, that had uh, sort of a side-scrolling pixel art uh, platform game at one point as well, so I might be getting mixed up with that, but yeah, certainly if you if you, if you you are an early purchaser of this game, uh, you'll get this bonus game as well, so um, yeah, so I mean, obviously being an isekai game, this is uh, an isekai anime, this is uh, ideally suited for adaptation to uh, a video game, so it sounds as if you got um, a sort of very quest-based structure. So you explore dungeons, you do fights, you upgrade and buy and sell weapons and that sort of thing. Um, and um, there's a sort of dating sim element to it as well. So no. Sort of, oh, you, you, who'd have thought it? Uh, but uh, yeah, so you can... Um, but in order to get to the the, the sort of uh, the Dayton Hot Springs co sleeping events, as it refers to them, co sleeping, <laughs> <laughs> um, you 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 have to sort of clear the post game content from the sound of things. So you have to sort of uh, really really work at it to to get mm. your rewards. Um, but yeah, Dan Machi Dan Machi has some great characters in it. So um, this is uh, this is cool. Be interested to see how this turns out. I kind of bounced off Danmachi, but you, yeah. you call you call me when Konos when the Konosuba game gets the same <laughs> gets the same news, and we'll talk. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, and the final thing we got on the list is that the uh, the Turbo Graphics and PC Engine Mini that was announced a while back has been confirmed for release in march of next year and i think the complete lineup of games has been announced now. yeah as well, that's isn't it? that's the big thing I, I could care less about the release date the the big thing about this is this might officially be the new king of these mini consoles yeah because it has 50 games and unlike every other one on the market it's not region sensitive mm-hmm. no matter which one you get you get the same 50 games some of them english some of them japanese they just dumped yeah. all the games on there this is worth the price of admission alone. Yes. For Dracula X, East One and Two, Lords of Thunder, and Soldier Blade. Yes. Uh, everything else is just delicious. <laughs> I mean, Newtopia One and Two, incredible. Alien Crush, incredible. R Type, like this thing is a monster. Mm-hmm. Also, Parasol Stars, which hasn't been re-released since sort of probably these mid 90s so like the Let's last time i last time i played parasol stars was on the atari st which was one of the best ports of it in fact one of the only ports of it besides the pc engine version uh, parasol stars for the unfamiliar is the third bubble bubble game yeah um and it's uh, oh it's it's a lovely charming game in which you use umbrellas to defeat enemies with and it's i i love it it's one of my favorite sort of single screen platform defeat all the enemies games and yeah so happy to have the opportunity to play it again let's Um, play how much is parasol stars going for on ebay right now (laughs) okay so i'm not seeing any copies for less than 120 (laughs) dollars so there you go you've already justified the price of the pc engine mini yeah, I, I mean, even the Atari ST version is hard to find these days. Like, you, you can find the demo disc from ST Action, which had like five levels on it. For like, even that's like sort of ten quid um, for a demo. Uh, but yeah, yeah, actually, actually tracking down the original copy is, is very difficult. Uh, there is one difference between the regional versions of this, and that is that the Japanese PC Engine Mini has Tokimeki Memorial instead of Salamander. Oh, um, well, no big but, loss there. I'd rather have Salamander. 
Yeah, I mean, exactly. Tokimiki Memorial is a very text-heavy game anyway, so unless you are sort of fluent in Japanese, that's not going to be of particular value to the English audience anyway. So, I, I mean, from a historical perspective, it would be cool to see, but I, you wouldn't get a lot out of it if you weren't able to understand what was going on. Wait, are we getting Snatcher too? Is Snatcher on this? This is incredible. Holy shit, yes it is. Fucking hell. I mean, hell. It's, the, it's the Japanese version of Snatcher, yeah. but it's still awesome. It's, yeah. worth it. it's worth it just to leave that game running in the background to listen to <laughs> freaking soundtrack yeah this is this thing is killer it's got yeah, milit this... it's got military madness on it mm -hmm. oh <laughs> oh this this is great and like when, when i first saw this i i i, I thought this this was going to be uh, a great console to kind of introduce people to the turbo graphics and pc engine and we've talked about before this is this is not a console that i know very well either because it's it's so hard to kind of get hold of and get up and running here in europe um, and so this is going to be a great way for me to learn more about it as well. So yeah, I'm definitely going to be picking one of these up for it's sure. Got, it's got Cho Anarchy. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Right. Um, okay. Um, so I think that's probably all the news we want to talk about for the minute. Uh, so let's take a short break and then we'll come back and talk about what we've been playing recently. So we'll see you in just a moment. Welcome back. For our second segment, we are going to talk about what we've been playing recently. So I'll hand over to Chris, first of all. What have you been up to? Mm, well, it was interesting that we kind of ended our last segment with a brief mention of Parasol Stars and kind of the joys of single-screen enemy-clearing games. Mm -hmm. um, my latest obsession has been rediscovering tribute games Curses and Chaos. Oh, yes, that's a great game. Yeah, so Curses and Chaos is a traditional... Uh, single screen enemy clearing game in the vein of bubble bobble or the original mario brothers um it's by tribute games who are perhaps most famous for um, the scott pilgrim versus the world beat em up under ubisoft and their own r.i.p yeah and their and their own <laughs> independent efforts which include uh mercenary kings which is perhaps their most well-known success story yeah um I love their work um, for a number of reasons, obviously because it's almost always super mechanically sound, but also because they always collaborate with Paul Robertson, who is perhaps one of the most talented um, Western-based pixel artists in the industry today. Um, oh, his, yeah, name, his name is pretty much well-known at this point. Uh, and their soundtrack um, guy, Patrice Borgo, is just mm. absolutely fantastic for his fusion of chip tunes with like a rock aesthetic. Um, so just... Everything's wonderful about Curses and Chaos. It has this beautiful kind of tongue-in-cheek fantasy setting. Um, so all the enemies you're fighting are kind of what you would expect from like traditional RPG enemies. But it's all wrapped up in this wonderful, hectic arcade enemy wave system where... Uh, every level has a kind of a contained theme, and you fight 10 waves of enemies. You have to clear each wave in under 60 seconds, or else a Grim Reaper shows up who can kill you in one hit. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just cleverly designed with a simple tool set. So the, the yeah. challenge of the game comes from the fact that every enemy has a very specific attack pattern and set of capabilities. It's up to you to memorize those capabilities, and then the composition of the waves is where the challenge comes from like okay so here's three skeletons a wolf and two witches well i know that i have to jump kick the witches three times i have to hit the wolves two times but i can only hit them once before they run into me so i have to punch the wolf in the face while jumping over it while it rushes at me i can hit kick the witch while i'm <laughs> jumping over the wolf land behind the wolf finish the wolf off jump over the skeleton jump kick the witch again it's like this mental geometry that you have to do yeah. on how to manage this this tight space is just addictive as hell and it's uh, yeah. it's co-op bliss if you've got a friend to play couch mm -hmm. with it's it's impo I, I don't know how it's possible to clear this game without a friend. It, it's 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 <laughs> yeah. designed with two player in mind. Um, I've gotten further than I've ever gotten before thanks to having a friend who finally gets it. It's took it's taken me almost two years to find a friend who gets this game. But now that yeah. I have a friend who actually enjoys it, we've been playing it like every weekend. Oh, great, great. Good stuff. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I own this, but I think when I was subscribed to PS Plus, it was a PS Plus game one month, and I spent quite a bit of time playing it then. So, 
Uh, yeah, you've just reminded me how much fun I have with it, so I might have to actually try and pick up a, my own copy of that at some point. Yeah, lovely game, lovely game. I tell you what your mention of tribute games, and particularly Scott Pilgrim and the World, made me realise there is something we didn't mention in the news segment, which I'm going to bring up now because I think it's important. Oh, so important. Uh, which, is, which is River City Girls. Yeah! Oh, yes. So, River City Girls is uh, Way Forward's upcoming release that features... Uh, two of the girls from the Kunio Kun series who were last seen in a Super Famicom game that I can't remember the name of, uh, but they were playable in that as well. So, yeah, it's a side scrolling beat em up in which these two girls are going to save their boyfriends. So, a nice inversion of the usual uh, 80s and 90s beat em up formula. And oh, it looks great. Looks great. Animation is gorgeous. And yeah, I'm always on board for any, any old school brawler action. So, yeah, mm-hmm. this looks great. Yeah, and it's Kunio Kun, yeah. so it's going to have light RPG elements, character development. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, very exciting. Yeah, yeah. So I just just wanted to make sure we mentioned that because otherwise I would kick myself for not mentioning. Yeah, it, I know. And Limited Run has already confirmed. Yes, so I will be all over that. All right, uh, back to games. You've been playing anything else? Uh, it's just mostly mostly that. I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, What else? I had one other thing. Oh, yes. I did recently finally receive my copy of Game Tengoku Cruisin' Mix from from Limited Run. Um, (laughs) It's very difficult to really... (laughs) So, Game Tengoku Cruisin' Mix isn't a very good (laughs) (laughs) shoot-em-up. But it's a very fun shoot-em-up. Yeah, yeah. Um, The patterns are kind of inscrutable. The enemies are kind of bullet sponges. The some of the ships are just useless because they're more joke characters. So like, mm-hmm. uh, from a from a perspective of like pure balance and like, is this a game of quality? The answer is probably no. But conceptually, it's such a curiosity that it's worth owning. Yeah. Uh, so background of this is uh, game can ten Goku Cruise and Mix. Um, is an effort from Jalico of all people back in the Saturn era to make an arcade shoot 'em up that unites kind of mul- multiple of their properties and brings them all together. So there's just... I don't even know Jalico well enough to know what half the characters in this are from. The only one I mm-hmm. know... The only one I know from my own personal experience is Clarice from City Connection. Yes. And you be her in a shooter in in the car. The car is just flying through the sky, and <laughs> and and her normal attack is just you just launch barrels that like stream <laughs> like, that just like stream off and like leave like missile contrails behind. Um, it, there's a pig. I don't know. There's a lot of like cute girls. I I, I, I <laughs> this game is just weird as hell. So every level. It's a horizontal shoot 'em up, and every level is a tribute to a different type of arcade game. Mm-hmm. So, like, level one is just a tribute to arcades in general. So, like, you're flying through, like, pinball tables, and some of the enemies you're fighting are just, like, sentient arcade machines. Um, level two is a tribute to crane machines. Mm-hmm. So, you get sucked in the crane machine. And then all the uh, all the enemies are just like the adorable stuffed animals from the crane machine. <laughs> and I know I sent you a screenshot a little while back, but the girl you're obsessed with from Rodland is in the background as one oh. of the as one of the stuffed animals in the background art. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's awesome. There's a level. My favorite level is the one that starts off as a tribute to racing games. Yeah. So like all the all the enemies are cars that are like driving around the track and when you shoot them they skid out and like <laughs> and like fly off the track and crash. <laughs> that's awesome. So yeah, that's that's game Tengoku Cruise and Mix. There's not a hell of a lot I can say about it. The the modern version is really interesting um, because it allows you to play both the arcade original and the Saturn port which have slight differences. Um, there's also a really cool history function uh, in one of the menus where you can actually learn about the different classic Jalico games and like what the characters are from and like the history oh, of the games cool. they're from. Um, and it's cute. Yeah. And it's cute because it's narrated by the character who's from the game, and they're kind of acting as like an unreliable narrator, like making themselves <laughs> sound way cooler than they are. And like yeah, the, cool. the the cute girl who like runs the arcade is like trying to provide the real information while like <laughs> the bozo from the game is like talking over her. 
Yeah. Uh, so it's it's just a really really charming game, but um, it is uh, you know if you miss the limited run release, it is available digitally. Uh, the only thing I don't like about it is the the DLC characters are inordinately expensive. Yeah. So there's a couple DLC characters, and they're like ten dollars a pop, and it's like I'm not yeah. paying ten bucks for a, shm- a ship and a shooter. Yeah. Um, especially when Darius Burst was ten dollars for their packs, which included stage elements and four ships. Yeah. It's so it's a bit exorbitant, but mm-hmm. otherwise it's it's really a, a interesting game and worth checking out for sure. Yeah. Does Clarice make any reference to the fact that she was inexplicably replaced by a smoking blonde man in uh, the American version of City Connection? No, I don't think so. <laughs> That's a shame. That's a shame. That could have been entertaining. Yeah, I, di- I didn't know anything about that um, that bit of localization until I actually looked into City Connection a bit more a few weeks back for mm-hmm. the article I wrote on it. But, uh, yeah, that was... That was interesting. I don't really know why that happened. Because America. Yeah. Like, why would anyone in the West want to play as a girl? Uh, yes, like. and we all know that women can't drive either, don't we? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> uh, do you have that stereotype in the States? That women can't drive? Oh, yeah, for sure. Ah, I mean, good, it's, good, yeah. It's, 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 like a, it's like a staple well, I, of 19, I, I, 1970s I, British comedy. <laughs> I live, well, I live in America, so right now the pervading opinion is that either women can do everything or women can do nothing, and it's just both yes. sides yelling at each other. So there's no, <laughs> there's no balanced opinion. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh. Yeah, yeah, so that's probably why. It was just, you know, they made those decisions all the time for stupid reasons like that. Yeah, it just kind of surprised me because I mean, because he's smoking, and that's not something that I uh, expect to see in a Nintendo game from that era. I but thought they were pretty strict about that sort of thing. But, but how uh, were you supposed to know that he was cool? Oh, just true. Well, he's got sunglasses, and he's got a kind of oh. blonde Elvis haircut, so oh. you know, surely that's enough. Surely that's enough. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So, anything else uh, that you've been up to? That's it for me. Uh, as I mentioned in our uh, kind of preparatory discussions i've been playing bloodstained more than anything but i think that's going to merit its own episode once we yes, uh, once you've had time to play it as well yeah i want to jump into that in a bit more detail once they've uh, sort of implemented the patches that they're working on for the switch version yeah um so hopefully that will make it more like the sort of definitive edition of it if you like um so um and, and maybe once some of the uh, additional modes and characters and dlc and stuff is out as well but mm-hmm. yeah there's definitely an episode uh, coming up for that at some point all right, I've got a bunch of things to talk about because I've been playing sort of a load of different bits and pieces recently. Um, I've already mentioned the expression Emeralata, so I won't talk too much about that, but I will just say it is at the time of recording the current cover game on Moe Gamer, so go and have a look at that if you want to find out a bit about this game and where Esperanto came from and why it thinks it's relevant, um, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, it's It's been really interesting to learn this, this stuff, even if it's not particularly sort of useful, if you like. Um but uh yeah it's 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 an interesting visual novel and the the sort of educational content is sort of really adding something to it as well so i've been enjoying that a lot okay uh so sort of first major thing i want to talk about then is uh, super mario maker 2 which came out a little while back uh which i've been having a lot of fun with um so super mario maker 2 uh sort of brings one of the wii u's most popular games to the switch which uh, immediately means its audience is about 10 times larger than it was originally um which is cool because super mario maker on wii u was really popular but it was popular on a platform that didn't have that many people on it so now it's popular on a platform that does have a lot of people on it i think they said that they passed two million levels uploaded the other day and it's been out for what two weeks yeah <laughs> which is pretty crazy um yeah so um there's a lot of cool things about this and improvements over the original so the i think probably the most interesting thing about it uh, sort of in terms of stuff that's been added is the addition of the story mode uh, so the original super mario maker it had a really sort of half-assed single player mode called the 10 mario challenge where there were just sort of 10 levels that had been designed by nintendo that you could just play and it didn't really it, it, it was just it was just 10 mario levels it wasn't particularly interesting or anything like that because the main focus of the package was going online downloading new levels making your own levels that sort of thing uh, but what they've done in super mario maker 2 is they've done this 100 level story mode um in which each level is clearly designed to show you a possibility so it's, it's clearly designed to show you something you can do within the within the constraints of what is available to you in the game 
and that means that it's it's showing off the different sort of level objectives you can do uh it's showing off how you can uh, creatively use the thing that uh, if you draw a, a wall of hard blocks up the side of the screen it will stop the screen from scrolling so you can do use that to make individual rooms rather than scrolling levels uh, it shows how you can make sort of puzzle based levels in which you sort of need to make creative use of things like p-switches and springboards and that kind of thing and it shows you sort of the key features of the various different um game styles that you can use in there as well so the game styles that are in there now there's super mario brothers 1 super mario brothers 3 super mario world super mario new super mario brothers u and super mario 3d world from um the wii u so the super mario 3d world one is kind of the enemies and the moves and stuff on that transplanted into 2d rather than allowing you to make 3d levels um but it's distinct enough from new super mario brothers u to be its own thing and yeah it's 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 quite interesting over the course of the story mode to kind of really get a feel for the differences between these different game styles and what kind of level each one is more or less appropriate for and so using that you can get a good feel of things that you might want to design um, that's then complemented by a very very substantial series of tutorials um, that go across three different tiers of experience if you like that tell you sort of the basics of how to create levels but along the way they also talk a lot about um things like the psychology of creating levels and uh how to treat the player fairly and things you should try and avoid doing as well so um they talk about things like using the coins to mark out paths or to tempt the player into particular areas uh they talk about um making uh, sort of constructing your level in such a way that it can be challenging but not overly daunting so it's it, it you don't present the player with a challenge that seems to be completely impossible so they'll just give up and all sorts of things like that so it's a really substantial package in that regard um the online stuff um they've made it so that you can tag levels now so if there's a particular type of level that you're looking for so if you really like the kind of uh sort of heath robinson style auto mario levels where the whole level plays itself then you can search specifically for those if you like the levels that make use of the note blocks to play music you can search for those if you just want a normal level you can look for those uh, and if you want levels that are specifically designed for multiplayer you can look for those as well um multiplayer is the one thing that i don't like at all uh because i just i've just never felt that super mario games work in multiplayer no. i've tried the i've tried the new super mario brothers games and super mario 3d world in multiplayer and they, they just don't work there's just no point to having more than one person on screen it's just it's just you getting in each other's way which is fun for about five minutes but then you realize you actually want to complete the level and it's just yeah it's just not fun then and so there's there's a competitive versus mode in this in which you race to the finish line will be the first to complete the objective um and that's obviously a load of shit because everyone is deliberately getting in each other's way in that one and then there's a cooperative mode in which everyone accidentally gets in each other's way all the time and that's quite dull as well so <laughs> um but that's fine and this is also why i'm not uh, as pissed off as the rest of the internet was when the nintendo said that you you can't play with friends it's like i don't care i don't want to play with friends i want to play super mario maker by myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like old school Mario multiplayer, like Mario 3, where you trade off if you die or complete a level, and you're like yeah. kind of cooperatively making your way through the world like that. I used to like that, but I hate when yeah. you're on screen together. Yeah, no, it it just doesn't it it doesn't work in a, in that kind of two D game because you need sort of a plane that you can move around each other. So sort of a two and a half D game works a lot better. So uh, although that said, Super Mario three D World didn't really work that well either. So I don't know, but anyway, that's that's the only really sort of weak spot in the package for me. So um, I've designed a couple of levels along the way as well, and that's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been really interesting to sort of go through the whole level design process, testing it along the way, realize the things that the sort of psychological tricks that you get caught on even if you've designed the level so like there was one point in the own in my own level that i made that i was just continually caught in because there was just something in my brain just went oh you, you can survive that that's fine and like every time i died in this exact same place and it was just really interesting to experience that even though i'd made that level even though i knew what was going on and just thinking well is everyone else going to get caught there is everyone going to get pissed off for that or are they going to be like oh i should be more careful or whatever so hmm. 
and then it's and then it's interesting to be able to upload stuff online and get the comments on there because the way the comments work in Super Mario Maker is while people are playing, they can leave a comment at a specific spot on your course as well. So if they spot something that um, they particularly like, or if they get stuck somewhere, uh, they can leave you a message and say say what's happened or what they like about that particular thing. So that can be really helpful as well. So for example, in one of the levels I made, I accidentally put in a point where if you do a particular combination of things, you can get yourself stuck. And I didn't notice that while I was testing the level because uh, the the combination of things that you do is not something that I thought anyone was going to do. <laughs> but two people two people did it and left me a message, a very polite message, I should say, um, and said that they, that they got stuck in that area. So now I know that that particular layout of things that I put in there is not something I should pursue in, in future levels, which has been hmm. really helpful. And so by, by doing that, you can kind of learn and grow as a creator as well. Uh, the one thing that um, is worth talking about with Super Mario Maker, I think, is a thing I wrote an article about recently, which is that most of the coverage of it in terms of articles and videos in particular tends to focus on the super difficult side of things so either levels that are designed to be ridiculously challenging or levels that use sort of kaizo elements to kind of trick the player along the way yeah and i i think it's worth it's worth highlighting and emphasizing the fact that that is not the entirety of the super mario maker experience because you because that is the stuff that tends to get focused on by articles and videos and so on don't let that put you off trying out this game because there are there is a lot of stuff out there that is just people making really good super mario levels as well so don't let the things that get all the attention put you off that sort of thing because i've been having a real blast and I, I don't enjoy those super hard levels i don't enjoy kaizo levels um but there's still plenty of stuff there for me as well so that's that's worth highlighting um yeah so that's that's been a good time i've been really enjoying that uh i've been playing a lot of breath of the wild recently as well i know i'm very late to the party on that but um i decided it was finally time to buckle down and engage with that so i've been writing my zelda diary series over on myogamer.net to sort of chronicle the things that i found particularly interesting or noteworthy as i'm playing through that because i know that this is such a big game that i need to tackle it over the long term alongside other stuff rather than devoting all my time to it i, I also kind of didn't want to make it into a cover game feature because most of the time with my cover game features i like to highlight stuff that is slightly lesser known um and there's been a lot of words written about breath of the wild online already so it's it's not that i don't think it's worth it it's that um i i wanted to handle it a little bit differently and sort of highlight give some other games the opportunity to shine but i still wanted to get some thoughts down on paper but i've been really really enjoying this game um and uh, i sort of held off it a long time um sort of around its original release because of all the all, all the people who compared it to stuff like skyrim um but having <laughs> played it a whole bunch they, they, no there's the the comparison just is not there it is not skyrim at all it, it is yeah. its own unique distinct thing it does open world better than pretty much any game i've ever played yeah um just because of the the amount of freedom of movement you've got um the, the addition of that climbing mechanic is the main thing i always bring up when i'm talking about this because just the ability to climb up most surfaces just opens up that world in ways that other open world games over the years are just the the, cl the the game that's come the closest to allowing you that level of freedom is assassin's creed and that was only in sort of very specific places that you could do that whereas in zelda you can latch onto pretty much any wall climb up it and sort of make your own route around things and explore and see what's on top of things and i mentioned in one of my articles that um there's kind of um a hint of the same design philosophy as mario odyssey in there so mm, we talked yeah. we talked a while back about how mario odyssey always rewards you for thinking oh what, what's that oh i wonder if i can do this and mario odyssey always rewards you for that by giving you a moon or something like that. and in zelda it rewards you in the same way because it, it doesn't have the same sort of uh, the same sort of reward structure as Mario Odyssey. It's not necessarily something concrete, but it will reward you with something worthwhile if you find your way to a location or or, or answer that question. I wonder if I can do this. So it might good just be, high durability weapon or something of that nature. Yeah, or even just just a good viewpoint that gives you yes. that, that gives you. Um, a good overview of the area that you're in and allows you to see some shrines that you might have missed or that sort of thing it's just, it's just an exceptionally designed game it's 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 really good it's got a wonderful atmosphere it's got lovely writing and characterization for the the people that you encounter which which is the main thing that sort of puts me off stuff like skyrim um 
and yeah, yeah, I'm just having having a ton of fun with it. And it's a great uh, game. Yeah, absolutely. And at the time of recording in Europe, certainly, um, there is a sale on the eShop and the, the DLC pack is, I think, 33% off. So if you have Breath of the Wild and you haven't picked that up and you're in Europe, uh, you can get that for a bit cheaper right now. So I, I did that the other day, even though I'm nowhere near the point in the game where most of that becomes relevant. There is there is sort of a whole bunch of treasure hunts that you can do sort of during the base game, but the, the kind of major content like the, uh, the Master Trials and the Champions Ballad stuff, that's all sort of um kind of post game stuff um but yeah i i picked that up anyway just because i i i know that i'm enjoying this game so much i i just wanted to sort of make sure i have the full experience if you like okay uh what else uh i picked up senran kagura peach ball recently uh because that came out this week i think um so i actually imported a physical copy from um the states because it's only an eShop release in europe for some reason and yeah i've been having a lot of fun with that so there's been some criticism of it for being oh it's a 40 dollars pinball game but um you know it's a really good 40 dollars pinball game uh there's a substantial story mode to it so each of the main characters have their own story route so just as in stuff like bon appetit and stuff like that there's uh, a silly enjoyable story to follow in that and then there's the free mode where you can just play as much as you like as well um and it's yeah, it's it's just really fun. It's a it's a satisfying video pinball game that of the mold that um, sort of provides you with a pinball experience that wouldn't be possible in real life. Yes, my favorite. Um, yeah, and not just because there's a giant girl sitting on the table that you repeatedly slam pinballs into the ass of, but uh, also because of the sort of mini games and the mechanics of the table and the way things open up and sort of take you down into different areas and that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's a lot of variety there. It's it's a very accessible pinball game, so it's it's not like super overly complicated, but there is plenty of mechanics on the table for you to engage with and aim for. And it's been quite fun because you, you can sort of feel yourself improving with each attempt you make as well. So, and you can kind of quantify that with the score as well, which is nice. So, how yeah, many I've tables been, are there? There's only two, uh, which is one, one, of the, one of the things that people have been a bit upset about. But both of those tables are pretty substantial um, in that they've got sort of side areas and mini games and that sort of thing. So, it might not sound like a lot, but there, there is a lot to both of those tables. Sure. Um, and as, as someone, as um, patron Ken pointed out in the Discord the other day, if you look back to something like Devil Crash, that cost 6,300 uh, 6, yen in 1990, and that had one table. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so it, 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 it probably the best comparison is this is a game designed after the mold of those old um, those old pinball games on the, on the PC Engine. So, um, yeah, if you're into that kind of thing, then great. If not, then, well, it's it's not a sort of main part of the Sinran Kagura uh, continuity and timeline, so you can skip it if you want to. But if you enjoy pinball, this is really fun. So I've uh, been having a lot of uh, a lot of uh, good times with that. So what I'm going to do, I think, is because there's a few Sinran Kagura games that I have had on my shelf for ages and haven't covered yet, uh, probably after Ambrolato is done, I'm going to do a catching up with Senran Kagura feature in which I'll cover uh, Bon Appetit, Burst Renewal, Peach Beach Splash, and Peach Ball. Um, so if uh, you want to know about any of those, then watch out in the next couple of months or so. And I'll be writing up some stuff on those in a bit more detail. Because it's, uh, it's been a while since I engaged with this series, and uh, I'd kind of forgotten how adorable these characters were. And uh, when you dress them up in bunny outfits and make them go pion pion, it's uh, even more adorable. <laughs> <laughs> no arguments here. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, I think those were the main things I wanted to touch on that we're not going to be talking about in our third segment. So, anything else you want to bring up before we move on? Nope, that's it. All right, good stuff. Let's take another short break then, and we'll be back in just a moment. See you then. <laughs> Welcome back. For our main topic today, we wanted to focus on the SNK 40th anniversary collection that was put out by Nice America a little while back. So there's a bunch of interesting games on here, and they all encompass the kind of pre-Neo Geo era, which is one of the things that makes this collection so interesting, I think, because 
SNK is reasonably well known these days for uh, kind of their fighting games and their Neo Geo era stuff, but a lot of their earlier stuff tends to kind of fall a bit by the wayside. So I think this was sort of the reason this collection was designed in the way it was, is to sort of show that SNK had been around for a long time and that SNK had been a highly creative creator of games, um, sort of as early as the, the, the very early days of gaming, so sort of back in kind of the Space Invaders era and so on. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot to talk about with this collection. So, did you have a particular point where you wanted to start with this? Oh, I mean, I just kind of had noted a couple of the games that I enjoyed most. Um, but, okay. I, I mean, I think, you know, my whole approach to really enjoying this collection comes from my my lifelong status as a tremendous fan of the Neo Geo. Yeah. So, so what I really did a lot when playing around with this is just kind of looking for titles that like obviously felt like proto neo geo games like what are like what are the games that like really felt like i could draw a clean line to like a successor on the geo yeah so like i i think one of the games i wanted to start out talking about was paddle mania (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, okay. because Paddle Mania is so clearly proto Wind Jammers, it's ridiculous. Yes. Um, so Paddle Mania is like a weird, like semi sci fi take on like squash, mm-hmm. <laughs> where you're uh, one player, two players on both sides of a court, you're trapped in a box together. Um, the ball bounces off the walls in like this weird, kind of slow, floaty motion and then you have a goal behind you and you have a tennis racket and the, you just keep hitting the ball back and forth until you get it past the goal so it's a bit like uh squash and tennis meets air hockey mm-hmm. um and and the interesting thing being that it um if it was in the arcade which i guess we should first of all talk about the loop lever which most yeah. of these games is dependent on so um One of the innovations of old SNK was this um, actual piece of hardware called the loop lever, and that's exactly what it sounds like. It's a it was a dial that was incorporated onto the arcade machines that was actually used as a control input, and you could turn this dial left or right. Um, So what it allowed for, and this is essential to a lot of games on this collection, is a very smooth rotation based mechanics, um, almost like a proto analog. Yeah. Um, if you've ever played Breakout um, on an old Breakout machine with the dial control, yeah, you'll understand what we're talking about. But uh, SNK and their old games took this to an extreme by incorporating this into other types of games, action games, shooters, all kinds of things besides just games where you were moving a paddle left and right. Mm-hmm. Um, paddle Mania specifically incorporates the loop lever functionality by making it a left or right swing of your racket. Um, yeah. which dramatically affects the direction and the, the speed at which the ball you hit moves. If the ball is coming at you and you hit it with a left swing, you might backhand it, which will affect it radically differently than if you swing at it right and catch it with the center of your racket and just send it hurtling forward. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting um, mechanic. Yeah. Yeah. I, is it worth playing for hours? Probably not, but it's <laughs> but, but it's but it's super curious to play, especially as a fan of Windjammers, to kind of see where that super polished game may have had its roots. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, th- I think that the, the, we can't sort of underemphasize the the importance of the loop lever to a lot of these games because so many of these games were designed around the ability to move and aim independently of each other yes um and up until that point we we'd sort of seen a couple of twin stick twin stick games so we'd seen stuff like robotron which used two joysticks which is probably what we're most familiar with today and in fact is how this um this compilation implements the loot level thing because we can't twist an analog stick on the modern controller uh what we have in this collection is you just use the right analog stick to kind of mimic the effect of turning the dial so it's not exactly the same but it performs the same function it allows you to independently move in one direction and aim in another direction and the exact implementation of that varies on the game but it's um 
it's probably most commonly seen in uh, games that involve shooting in some way. So there's some spaceship shooters that make use of it, and there are some top-down run-and-gun games that make use of it as well. So um, I think sort of sort of the, the highlights for me so far have been uh, what I tend to think of as the Alpha Mission trilogy. Yeah, um, yeah you love these. Yeah, these are really cool games. So, so the first Alpha Mission actually doesn't incorporate the loop lever, but it's still um, still an interesting shoot 'em up in its own right, mostly because of its power up system. So, in Alpha Mission, the kind of uh, core hook on that is that as you collect power ups, you can sort of build various pieces of armor for your ship, and you can uh, store those bits of armor in an inventory and then trigger them as you see fit. Uh, and the different pieces of armor have different effects. So some are defensive and some are offensive. And the the best one is extremely powerful. It's sort of enough to take the final boss of the game down in a couple of hits, for example. But it takes quite a while to build up the parts you need to actually make use of that. Um, and so Alpha Mission is really interesting but just because you can kind of customize your ship and the way you play as you fly through it. Um, and it's just a really solid shoot 'em up. Now that was then followed up by a game called Bermuda Triangle, which um, it kind of uses a similar idea of kind of a ship with changing form, uh, but in the case of this one, it does it by collecting power ups and building up a meter. And at various points on that meter, your ship will transform and become something slightly different. So it will start having different firing patterns and that kind of thing. The really unique thing about Bermuda Triangle, though, is that your ship is enormous. Uh, you are basically flying a capital ship in this, so rather than the normal space fighter type thing, you're flying this enormous ship, uh, which means that you can't rely on a lot of the tactics that you would in a conventional top-down vertically scrolling shoot 'em up because your ship is so large, you can't sort of fit it through narrow gaps and kind of thread the needle through bullet patterns and so on. So there are situations where you have to know sort of what an appropriate maneuver is to kind of minimize the amount of damage that you're going to take. Um, and how to effectively manage that large mass that is your ship. But that does use the loop lever to control a turret on top of your ship, so you can fire in different directions, you can shoot all around you. And um, yeah, that's that's a cool game. That was then followed up by World Wars, uh, which I believe is a slightly lesser known game from SNK's history. Uh, but this this is a more conventional top-down shooter up in which you're, you're flying a fighter again. But again, it makes use of the loop lever so that you can fire in different directions. And again, as you collect power-ups, uh, your ship will gradually transform, change its firing patterns and, and how it works. Um, and so those three games are really good examples of... Um, what I think was a real strength of SNK in this period, which is that they often took existing formulas, but rather than just cloning existing games, um, they would put their own twist on them. They would make their own unique thing about them that really set them apart from their contemporaries. And that was the thing as far back as, um, if you look right back to one of their earliest games, like Ozma Wars. Uh, so Ozma Wars was a contemporary of Space Invaders, um, but it, it does things very differently from Space Invader. So you, you have you have an energy bar rather than lives, for example. This is one of the earliest examples of using an, uh, kind of a, a, a tank of energy rather than um, a stock of, of solid lives. And it, in practice, it works like lives, but it was, it was just interesting to see that uh, done that way. Um, it was also an early game to feature sort of swooping enemy patterns and things coming down the screen and things varying from level to level and bonus stages and that sort of thing. Um, it's Again, it, it's a game that not a lot of people know about because stuff like Space Invaders was much more well-known, um, but it does things in its own way in its own distinctively SNK way um, and it's it's just fascinating to look at these titles and see how they've put their own twists on these different genres I'm kicking myself for not writing the title of it down but there's that other game too it's also a Space Invaders contemporary but it's set in feudal Japan and you're oh, uh, Sasuke and Commander yeah so like you're a yeah. nin you're a ninja taking down other ninjas who are up in the treetops and it plays like Space Invaders, but the the caveat is that when you kill an enemy ninja, his body drops from the tree. So you yes. you have to actually dodge the falling bodies of the guys you take out as well, yes. <laughs> which I thought was really an interesting kind of wrinkle to throw into that formula. Uh huh. That game is also probably the first use of the word boss 
um, to feature a sort of end level guardian. Um, so that's that's quite an interesting game from a historical perspective as well. It kind of introduced the idea of end level bosses to a lot of people, mm. um, and it's, it's it's a surprisingly fun game as well. I mean, it, obviously, it's quite primitive compared to later stuff because it's it's very much an old school fixed tutor. But the the little twists it adds on there, um, yeah, it's it's really cool. Um, also, another minor little thing it innovated in. I think it was the first Japanese arcade game to have kanji on the screen as well. Oh yeah. Um, so um yeah so noteworthy from that regard as well it's it's been absolutely fascinating to to look into these games for the first time because a lot of them i'd never heard of um which actually kind of brings up an interesting point of how my attitudes towards um arcade game compilations have changed over the years so if i think back to sort of maybe the ps2 and xbox era um there were a bunch of arcade game collections you could get for those platforms, mm-hmm. um, including some SNK stuff. Um, but I would tend to gravitate towards packages that had games I had heard of on them. Oh, sure. So I would tend to gravitate towards things like the Midway Arcade Treasures Collection because those were all games that I'd grown up with, the old sort of Atari games, jams, and that sort of thing. Um, and I would I would often tend to sort of steer clear of even stuff like Taito Legends and stuff like that because 90% of the stuff on Taito Legends was stuff that I, I'd never even seen, let alone played at the time. Um, you know be- you know better now. I know much better now. Yeah, that's that, that's my main point. So Think now, about all the years you could have been playing Cleopatra's Fortune. And- I know, I know. Kicking myself, kicking myself, absolutely kicking myself. But yeah, so is it, but that's, I mean, that's what I want to highlight is sort of as I've got older and sort of become more interested in finding out new experiences rather than just different ways of having experiences that, I, that I've had for a long time, I, I can now really see the value of these compilations that have lesser known games on them. And I know that um, the people behind this SNK compilation here would deliberately put a bunch of stuff on here that wasn't very well known purely so that they could educate people on SNK's history in full. So, and so not just its best bits, but some of its most interesting bits as well, even if they didn't quite work. Like, have you, have you played Fantasy? Yes, fantasy is weird as shit. Okay, yes. so so first of all, we can't talk about fantasy without talking about one of the hallmarks across pretty much all these games, which is classic SNK's weird preoccupation with terrifying digitized speech samples. <laughs> oh my god, yes. Yes. So like when you fire up fantasy, like the whole the whole rope of fantasy is that you're you're this like adventure dude like rescuing his girlfriend from like various dangerous situations. And it just opens up with this like terrifying dialogue where like this man's voice is just like, "Hello, how are you?" And then this girl's I'm fine, like, "Thank you." Ah! <laughs> 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 just this polite conversation capped by a pirate kidnapping and then <laughs> but it's it's not just fantasy like so many of like the military games have just these horrifying like garbled like death screams and yeah. it's uh, like Aah! but yeah fantasy is the best one because of that bizarro conversation <laughs> It's great. It's like, yeah, we want a plot in this game. Have we, have we got any writers in the building? No, just just make something up. It's like, hello, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. And then, like, what does he say? Like when he dies, it's just like, oh no! It's like, it's like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's great. But I mean, you, yeah, you, you're quite right. Fantasy is weird as shit as a game as well. So, so fantasy was um, an attempt to kind of, uh, I mean, we, we joke about them not having a writer on the team, but kind of the intention behind fantasy was to tell a story through the gameplay. So rather than just having a series of levels that got a bit more difficult as you went through, fantasy was a, p- a specific attempt to kind of have a natural progression from challenge to challenge that kind of told a story as it went through. So the first level of fantasy has you trying to land a hot air balloon on the pirate ship that stole your girlfriend. And then when you when you land on the pirate ship, you then have to infiltrate the pirate ship and defeat the pirates on there. But then, oh no, your girlfriend gets taken away, so you then have to chase after them in a hot air balloon. And then, oh, it, it, it all escalates until eventually you're chasing down helicopters across the ocean, uh, firing at tanks on London Bridge, and then landing on London Bridge for the grand finale and stuff like that. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's but, cool. It's it's. The, yeah. Can we just talk about how like the pirate ship rescue level feels like proto East? 
<laughs> yes, yes. You, have, you have to like run into the guys but you you can't you're not attacking with your sword if you're moving up and down only left yes. and right so you have yes. to like line yourself up vertically and then like ram the dude's horse <laughs> <laughs> and there's like that cannon turret that's just like blasting you but the turret can also kill the enemy pirates so it's really yes. cool to lure the enemy pirates into the turret's line of fire yes and, yeah. like, we're talking about an ancient 8-bit game from the early 80s, and it, and it had an interesting mechanic where you could use the enemy's own traps against them. Yeah. Like, this is a really cool thing, and this is ancient. Like, this game is older yeah. than me. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, that was a particular highlight, and uh, I remember seeing, I think it was Frank Cifaldi on Twitter was... Um, was talking about fantasy and he, he said that fantasy was one of the games that they specifically put on there because it doesn't get talked about very much it's it's not a very well-known game and it's maybe not the best game but it incorporates so many interesting things about it that it's worth including in a compilation like this just so people can see how batshit crazy early era snk was and it's yeah it's a perfect example of that um from that same era as fantasy i think uh vanguard has become one of my favorites um i i hadn't heard of vanguard until quite recently i think um i was i think i was watching some videos on youtube and it was someone like classic game room or something like that did a review of the i think the 2600 version uh, okay uh, and and then i had a look at the atari 8-bit version for my atari a to z series on youtube and then as it happened uh, i picked up the snk 40th anniversary collection of vanguard was on there as well so i tried the original arcade version so i've tried three or four different versions of vanguard now and so vanguard is a horizontally scrolling shoot 'em up um it uses kind of a a precursor to the the loop lever system so i, I think it just used four buttons to fire mm. so you could fire it you could fire in four directions uh so but again it was the same intention so that you could move and fire independently of each other and Vanguard takes you on a progression through a series of different zones which are sort of loosely themed. So you have a zone where you're sort of fighting off airborne enemies, you have a zone where you're moving diagonally and having to avoid enemies that are moving in set patterns. Uh, you have a zone that is mostly about uh, shooting ground targets and that's where you score the majority of your points. Uh, you have vertically scrolling stages and you have another early example of a boss in vanguard as well so each level concludes with i mean it's it's hard to call it a boss fight because you only need one hit to kill it but um it, it is still a case of pattern recognition and timing your shots carefully so you can get through barriers and actually hit this end level guardian before moving on to the um the next stage vanguard again has lots of uh, vaguely terrifying digitized speech in it uh, it <laughs> It, it is also from the era before copyright was a thing that game developers had to worry about as well. So it features music from both Flash Gordon and Star Trek, uh, the motion picture in it as well at various points. Yeah, that's a, that's <laughs> another thing that brokers discussion is how rife with copyright infringement m most of these games in this collection are. <laughs> Yeah, like I one of the games I wanted to give a lot of lip service to specifically was Search and Rescue. Yeah. Which straight up just has the alien from Alien in it as like <laughs> a, a, as an enemy. But have you played this yet? I, I've played it briefly, but I, I didn't get very far in it, so yeah. I haven't pulled that one in detail yet. But yeah, uh, one of the one of like the most recurring enemies is just the alien from Aliens. <laughs> Fantastic! It's just like hissing and spitting acid, and the whole nine, and like the thing that comes out of his mouth. He's just he's just turquoise instead of black. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So. Um, but I mean that that's kind of an interesting contrast really isn't it because al al although the the kind of mechanical side of things is very original and creative um sort of the actual incorporating things uh, from movies and stuff in there that, yeah there was, ripping stuff off was absolutely rife in that period not just from SNK but oh, from no. in general oh no oh absolutely yeah. so, SNK I is specifically notorious for this though there's yeah. um there's a very famous example of... I mean, I, I don't want to talk about Neo Geo stuff too much, unless it's directly related to games on here, but just because it's part of the conversation we're having. Um, there's a very famous moment in the openings of Last Resort, which is a very famous horizontal shooter for the Neo Geo. Mm -hmm. And one of the first enemies you fight is a very... It's just a sprite of a, of a very famous enemy uh, robot from the Gundam series. <laughs> and he's just brown instead of blue and that's the only thing they've, <laughs> that's the only thing they've changed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it's it's hilarious 
Yeah. So I mean, I mean, I wonder how much of that was um, sort of a deliberate attempt to attract people and go, oh, hey, that's the thing from Gundam, or if it was just a case of oh, I can't draw a robot. Let's. <laughs> but like, what, what's weird is like, I don't think it is a case of I can't draw a robot because that game is stuffed to the gills with beautiful original mechanic design. Yeah. So well, it's. I think it's an instance of tribute more than anything. Yeah. I think it's it's just we really love this thing. Let's incorporate it. Yeah. Because we love yeah. it. Because uh, uh, search and search and rescue is full of all kinds of grotesque enemy designs that are completely original. Mm. I think it was just a matter of like we just saw Alien. We're not super familiar with American copyright law. Let's <laughs> let's 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 throw it in there. You, you yeah. know what I mean? I, I don't think there's anything malicious or even oh no no no, no. or even you know, la- you know lazy in attempt to not be original about it. I think it's more celebration and tribute of works that they find interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, that sounds about right. So um, so you mentioned at the start you wanted to kind of uh, trace a pattern. Up, up to sort of the Neo Geo era. So, yeah. so what, are, what are some of the highlights of that for you that you've sort of been able to spot so far? Uh, well, Search and Rescue, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure we'll pay some lip service later to the Akari games. And yep. I think I think a lot of people want to trace a line from the Akari Warriors series through to um, Shock Troopers. Yes. Um, but I would argue that Search and Rescue feels far more like Shock Troopers than Akari does. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly because Search and Rescue has a very satisfying dodge jump mechanic. Right, yeah. And, and the dodge rule with the invincibility frames is core to Shock Troopers gameplay. Yeah. Um, so granted, you wouldn't have Search and Rescue without Akari. So it's, it's kind of a straight line. You have Akari, Akari led to Search and Rescue... But Search and Rescue is definitely the linchpin that you can trace mm-hmm. directly to Shock Troopers. Yeah, definitely. Be- because of that dodge roll, mm-hmm. which is super important to Shock Troopers. Just the Akari series itself went on an interesting evolution as well, though, didn't it? Um, so, yeah. Like- I, have, I just have it here, like, Akari Warriors, iconic. Akari 2, I, my only notes for Akari 2 are WTF... Question <laughs> question mark space tarantulas question, <laughs> question mark um so Akari one is classic eighties like everybody fucking loves Rambo so let's make a Rambo game and it's yeah. a top down shooter with oily muscled men with rocket launchers getting in tanks occasionally mm-hmm. like. Everything is cool here. Then you play Akari 2, and you know something's wrong immediately when you look at... <laughs> when you see the official artwork on display for Akari 2 on the game select screen. Because it's like two men, like, Vogue posing with giant magic swords. <laughs> but they're still yeah. the Rambo guys. So yeah. it's like, why are these two Rambo men, like giving each other handies while clutching like massive like merlin swords and and then you fire it up and you're like okay time for like more gorilla action in like south america but this like giant like andros from Star Fox head appears yells at you in like garbled digitized speech and then and then you're like trapped in outer space with a rocket launcher that seems to like displace like red and black dark matter clusters <laughs> while endless streams of tiny green aliens and giant yellow space tarantulas hop at you and every single one of them makes terrifying digital speech just like ah, 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 when you kill them by the hundreds and then you fall through portals and then you're in like Aztec times, but you're still being attacked by alien tarantulas, and then An- Andros shows up and yells at you some more, and then you defeat him, and you get sucked into another time portal. Like, <laughs> nothing makes sense about Akari 2. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Then Akari 3, it's just, oh, we're, we're Rambo again. But what's really cool about Akari 3 is that it's no longer a run and gun. It's a run and punch dudes in the face. 
Yeah. So like guns are only an occasional power up, and you're using the loop lever to direct you know, the facing of your character, and you have a punch button, a kick button, and a jump button. So you're just like decking dudes in the face <laughs> for hour like and the guns and melee weapons are occasional power ups you pick up, but otherwise you're just like wading through swamps, like punching gorillas. And by gorillas, G U E R R, not G O R I. <laughs> Maybe yes. there's gorillas later in the game, but you're just you're like punching insurgents in the face to death, and then stabbing them also once you pick a knife up. But yeah, so it was in, that was an interesting game because it took the um, it took everything we know about top down running guns and added an in your face close up melee focus to it, which is actually kind of cool as hell. Yeah. And, the, and the sprites are massive and beautiful in Akari Three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I went nuts there. I'm sorry. No, it's it, it absolutely fine. I mean, I mean, Ikari two, Ikari two is is worth that that level of ridiculous outburst just because it's it's well. I mean, you've just heard what it is. <laughs> yeah, WTF space tarantulas. Oh God, yeah. So, but yeah, it, I, I mean, I I've certainly seen sort of um, the line that we can trace from those to stuff like shock troopers now as well, and um, it's really interesting to, to kind of see, to kind of see the sort of um, almost the thought process developing over the course of that series. So, like if you if you sort of go even before Ikari and look at Tank Three first, oh, well, absolutely, um, and sort of and sort of trace from that because canonically the guy in Tank Three is one of the guys from Ikari Warriors. Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's he's in something else random as well. I can't remember what it was, but there's there's like one of the guys from Ikari Warriors is, is in something else you don't expect him to be in as well. Right, and of well, course, he's he is he in King of Fighters now as well. Yeah. So there is Team Ikari yeah. Warriors in King yeah. of Fighters, which consists of the two guys from Ikari Warriors, Ralph and oh shit, what's the other guys? Clark, Clark yeah. and Ralph for the Ikari Warriors guys, um, and then their commanding officer Hydern. And then Leona is Hydern's daughter. So, like, yeah. that's one of the things SNK does amazing, is they, they pull characters from their entire history into King of Fighters. Yeah. And, of course, that is a perfect segue yep. to talk about we... Athena. Yes. Athena. Right. Um, should we start with, with, with the, the bad? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. We'll use the word interesting, though, because I, yeah. I, think, I think people... So, okay, like, one of the things that's wonderful about the SNK Anniversary Collection, it is not just an arcade tribute collection. Any of the games that have a console counterpart, you can actually press a button to swap between the arcade or console versions. Yes. So, Athena gets a really bad rap, and I think a lot of the bad rap Athena gets can be tied more directly to the, the NES slash Famicom version, yes. which is kind of rubbish. <laughs> but the arcade version of Athena is a really curious game that is really <laughs> worth exploring. Um, yeah, definitely. And I don't, I, you've probably played it a lot more than I have, but my hot take on Athena is two things. One, um, first of all, a 2D side-scrolling platformers in the arcade are a lot rarer than you realize once you think about it. Yeah, definitely. If you think about... The genres that you played in the arcade in the 90s, uh, 2D side-schoolers with a jump mechanic isn't really one of them. I mm -hmm. could only name maybe, besides the, you know, going to the Neo Geo, besides Metal Slug, which is, which is a run-and-gun, which is a very different thing, I can only yeah. really name three side-scrolling character-driven platforming games for the Geo. Yeah. And going to other arcade things like the CPS2 arcade board, there's very few I can name. So this isn't a genre you actually saw a lot in arcades. So Athena immediately gets kudos for trying to do that. Yeah. But I also think what Athena does that a lot of people don't pick up on well is that it's trying to incorporate the ethos of a side-scrolling horizontal shooter and the challenge of a horizontal shooter mm -hmm. to, to a character-driven platformer with a jump mechanic. Yes. The way the enemies attack you in waves, the the way the fact that you constantly kind of have to be moving, have to be attacking. There's there's times where it actually feels like a horizontal shooter. That's a, that's a melee game. Yeah. 
Well, there's, there's some interesting stuff about stuff from this period that, that the original Athena came out in. The SNK were specifically trying to blend genres together. Um, so, like, if we look at Alpha Mission as well, which is sort of a rough contemporary of Athena, um, Alpha Mission was a deliberate attempt to combine vaguely RPG inspired mechanics with mm-hmm. a space shooter. And so, so the, the collecting of armor and the upgrades and the leveling up and that sort of thing. Um, and then that kind of comes back into Athena as well. So, Athena is obviously a slightly what you might think is a slightly better fit for that sort of thing. But um, yeah, that also incorporates RPG style elements. So, you collect armor for Athena, um, you get different weapons for her you power up her maximum life and strength and that sort of thing and you progress in that way so as well as just progressing through the levels you actually progress in terms of character strength as well which again was quite an unusual thing to see in arcade games of that era um and but because it's an arcade game that's designed to be played sort of quickly and in short sessions the kind of pace at which you upgrade yourself in athena is quite high so literally with the the first enemy that you defeat in athena you'll get a new weapon which will make you more powerful and give you greater reach and so on and as you as you proceed through the rest of that level you'll you'll start finding new items and upgrades and things that give you unique special abilities and passive abilities and so on and the ability to do things like headbutt rocks to instead of having to hit them with your weapon and that kind of thing so yeah there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in the original athena um my my sort of main issue with it is it's just a little bit too difficult yeah oh it's impossible um, and and it, makes, it, it just makes it, it all of the stuff in athena i really want to enjoy like i really like the the kind of progression system i like the fact that she's trying to build up armor and stuff but i but i can't finish the first level I, I can't even get like to the boss of the first level. I just can't do it be- yeah. because it's so difficult. Yeah. Um. It, it, and it, that that aspect of it just makes it quite tough to enjoy for me. Um. Like I re- like I say, I really want to like it. There's everything about this game should sort of tickle all the pressure senses in my game, right down to the fact that it stars a girl with big tits and a bikini. Um. But yeah, it's it, 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 the, the, just just kind of the balance of it is just just a, a little bit off for me. Oh, um, for sure, yeah. Mm. But, but like, I, there, I, there's I, so much to explore about it that's interesting. Like, yeah. Like, the scope of the levels is yeah. so impressive. The verticality, the extent to which you can explore them. Uh, like, yeah. Like, you mentioned, uh, you, you break blocks. There's destructible environmental elements. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. a lot of this stuff is pretty impressive for its era. Yeah, and there's, there's multiple routes you can take. There's uh, sort of secrets all sorts of things so yeah lots of impressive stuff going on and so it's sort of if you can get over that d- difficulty spike that's a mile high in that then there's a lot to enjoy there but yeah it is it is getting past that in the first point that requires sure. a lot of practice and a lot of patience uh, to begin with um but yeah de- definitely still worth checking out um athena then went on to be in a much better game yes uh, which is psycho soldier which technically doesn't star the same athena um if you're being picky about it so so the like a descendant or something yeah do do they contextualize it that way yes yeah you say so she's a descendant of uh of the original athena and um that the athena in psycho soldier is then the athena who appears in most of the subsequent snk games like king Mm. of fighters and so on athena asamir yes but let's Um, let's be clear right off the bat athena's name is magic uh uh-huh mystery is what you see yes her crystal holds the answer fighting fair to keep us free yep so. yep yep so uh <laughs> we'll come back to that in a moment um so psycho soldier is um psycho soldier is actually a really uh, a really strange game in terms of what it is because it's it's kind of hard to describe in some ways because it's kind of a bit of one thing a bit of another thing and it, it again it's it's an example of snk blending different things together to produce something that in this case is kind of unique yeah um, there's nothing quite like psycho soldier <laughs> yeah so i mean psycho soldier incorporates elements of horizontally scrolling shoot 'em ups in that it's constantly moving forwards and you kind of move up and down and you shoot things but it's also a platform game because you're not freely moving up and down like controlling a ship you're jumping between different platforms on the screen in different lanes uh, and then it's got kind of a progression mechanic similar to that that was in Athena and Alpha Mission and that sort of thing in that you can power yourself up and get more powerful shots and have more powerful special abilities. And um, yeah, it's it's 
it's a really great game and it's yeah i i mean what what, what do you like about this because i i kind of finding it hard to describe exactly what i like about this but it's it's just it's it's just a, a game that is always a joy to play for me yeah um what do i love about psycho soldier um i love that the boss of the first level is an apartment building infested with <laughs> giant giant pill bugs and then you yep. and then you blow it up and then you jump off a cliff and then like your skirts flutter so like okay so for no people who don't know psycho soldier you've got to understand that psycho soldier is a direct effort to cash in on the magical girl yes uh trend so like athena is not just she athena is a magical girl who's also a pop star and she has a cute little skirt and like it's just like it's trying to play into all that so the enemies you fight are just these delicious cheesy like sentai inspired monsters and and like roly-poly demons and strange like mutated men in like black trench coats with hats and it's just it's just delightfully weird it's also cool because they're the, the stages have transitions but not um not like hard ended titles like the game the game just flows yeah so it's like you beat level one and there's an actual like animated transition of athena jumping off the cliff falling down into the sewer and then level two is the sewer but there's no like black screen like level two the sewer like it, it's almost telling you uh, an anime narrative yeah which is really cool yeah so and and the the song fits into that as well so so the the, the reference that was chris was making before to athena's name being magic and so on is the fact that psycho soldier opens as soon as you start playing with a song like not just like a, a catchy piece of music but an actual song there is someone singing it um which was unheard of at the time um so it's a combination of fm synthesis for the backing track and then a v incredibly crunchy low quality digitized singer over the top of it um in either japanese or english depending on which version you're playing um the the japanese singer uh was obviously quite a good singer the american singer was less so <laughs> someone's um, <laughs> child someone's <laughs> child like someone's kindergarten age child i <laughs> but it's it's just so charming because it it kind of tells the story of athena and who she is and wh why she's fighting and it's it's just the sort of thing you'd expect to hear in like an anime opening sequence or something like that but you get it every time you start the game and it's it's just delightful. yeah it's just it's just the stage one music is this anime opening essentially yeah. like reminding you that you are playing an anime and it mu and it's got to be one of the first games to ever try to do that yeah definitely definitely and um yeah and that song became really popular so um it, it actually got its own releases as, as a single in japan and i think there was one of the one of the home versions actually came with a cassette of it as well i think it might be in the famicom version it oh, actually wow. came with a, with a cassette of it um and so obviously that cassette now goes for astronomical amounts of money Not um better but uh that's also been remixed and heard in a bunch of the king of fighters games over the years um that original remix that was on the cassette is actually on the soundtrack cd of the limited edition for snk 40th anniversary collection as well oh wow um so you you could still hear that original version as well and uh obviously it's original japanese lyrics rather than the adorably uh cheesy american lyrics but yeah it's 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 a delight but yeah, Psycho Soldier was uh, sort of a really pleasant surprise. It's one of those games that sort of beforehand I'd heard of, but I didn't really know anything about. Um, but then checked it out and was immediately smitten with it. It's it's just such a fun game. It's it's one of those ones that's really easy to kind of latch onto and understand how you play it. But sort of progressing in it and getting better at it is a, is a, a sort of constant feeling of practice and improvement and so on. And it's a really satisfying game. It's one of my favorite games in this collection for sure. It's definitely one of the games that hues closer to being actually good instead of just being a historical curiosity. Because like, mm -hmm. let's be honest, a lot of these games aren't great. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of these games aren't great. A lot of them are very clunky, and they're more worth exploring as historical artifacts, kind of, kind of understanding these, like, through lines of design innovation. But, like, a lot of them are clunky messes. Mm -hmm. um, Psycho Soldier is one of the ones that hues closer to being a game you can straight up play and be like, this is a genuinely good game with 
really interesting mechanics that plays smoothly. Yes. A lot of these games are hyper unbalanced, really framey. Like they're not great, but they are interesting, mm-hmm. and that's a, that's a type of great. But yeah. Um, also in that category of games that are just straight up good on this collection is Prehistoric Isle. Oh yes, that's a great game. Which is a delightful horizontal shooter with a really fun setting, kind of taking advantage of the classic kind of pulpy 1930s comic King Kong craze where you are in a biplane um, on a lost island just like blasting dinosaurs. Um <laughs> Uh, two things that are notable about the game: it had a re- has a really cool option mechanic where you pick up the uh, the ship options and you can reposition that option. And depending on where you have that option positioned, it'll actually fire in different ways. So if it's positioned behind you, it'll shoot behind you. If it's positioned underneath you, it'll drop explosive bombs. If it's positioned in front of you, it'll supplement your standard stages. Are built around the notion that you should be mastering this mechanic by having threats kind of approach you from all sides. Um, yeah, it's it's quite heavily set yeah, piece based, yeah. isn't it? So there's a lot of sort of uh, scrolling in different directions and sort of ascending yeah. a ascending a mountain diagonally and then flying over the top of it and then descending down it and that sort of thing. So the first boss is mainly underneath you. He's a little like a little T Rex who's mainly underneath you, and he leaps up and tries to bite you. So you should be primarily using the bombs to to fight him. It's so it's really cool the way it's trying to convince you to use these different shot styles as you play um the other thing that's noteworthy about the game is the bosses are um multi-sprite they're these big dinosaurs and they're constructed of many sprites put together yeah so there's some really cool animation tricks with the fluidity of their movement and their attacks and stuff because they're all they're all built from multiple pieces which is always a really interesting aesthetic i mean to us now, it's very apparent, but in 1989, this shit was mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, not not quite the same as I was talking about with search and rescue, tracing a through line to shock troopers, but um, there is a prehistoric island two on the Neo Geo, mm-hmm. and prehistoric island two is great because it harkens back to one of the things we were talking about in our prior episode about interesting aesthetics. So, um, because Prehistoric Island, the very first one, the whole thematic thrust of the game was to pay tribute to that King, those King Kong Lost Island narratives, which were full of stop motion animation. Prehistoric Island 2, using the graphical power of the Neo Geo, uses pre rendered sprites to recreate that visual style. Oh, okay, cool. So the enemies actually look like rubbery puppets, <laughs> and it's delicious. So, so, yeah, that's a really, really fun game to play. If you've ever wanted to blast dinosaurs in the face with a biplane. Wow. Who hasn't? <laughs> yeah. I've thought about it. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Any other stuff that you'd like to talk about from this collection? No, I think you've covered a lot of the thing. Uh, Beast Busters is really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, just as an early light gun game. Um, it's not a great game, but the sprite work is beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it's got uh, actually a really interesting follow-up on the Neo Geo Pocket Color, which people oh, don't really? realize. Yeah, um, but it's it's a like a top-down action RPG with a yeah. horror with a horror setting that's like vaguely connected to it called oh, okay. Beast Dark Dark Arms Beast Busters, um, but it's set in the same universe. Yeah, um, but that's just more of a historical curiosity. Like it's a fun game to play with your friends because it's delightfully gory like all the yeah. enemies explode and like viscera and it's everything's phallic to a degree that's unsettling it, it's <laughs> it's so yeah beast busters is a really good time if you've got a buddy and you just want to sit down and kill 20 minutes yeah good stuff all right let's uh let's hold that discussion for that there then so as usual would you like to tell people where to find you online uh, absolutely. You can see my artwork at MrGilderPixels.com or on Twitter and Instagram, also at MrGilderPixels. 
marvellous. And you can find my writing on MarioGame.net and my video work on YouTube. Currently running on YouTube, we've got a few video series. We've got the ongoing Warriors Wednesday series, where I'm playing Warriors Orochi. Now on to the final campaign of that, the Way campaign. Uh, just started my Final Fantasy Marathon series with Final Fantasy 1, the PSP version. And then there's the Atari A to Z videos three times a week covering Atari 8-bit, Atari ST, and Atari Arcade and console games. So watch out for those. Uh, if you're listening on SoundCloud, don't forget there's a video version of this podcast that you can watch and admire all the games we're talking about. And if you're watching on YouTube and would prefer an audio version on the go, you can head over to SoundCloud and get that for yourself and subscribe and all that good stuff. So, as always, thank you very much for listening and are watching, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. Be sure to check out moegamer.net for new articles on Japanese and Japanese inspired video games, new and old, every weekday. Every month, Moegamer features an in depth exploration of an individual game or series as its cover game, so be sure to check the archives to see if your favourite has had a deep dive yet. If you'd like to support the site directly, please consider becoming a patron or buying me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.